ideas needed. The hunt for a theory of everything is going nowhere fast. From the editorial of New Scientist magazine, published December 10 of 2005, this headline underlines the sad state of theoretical physics and its inability to reconcile relativity and quantum theory, and so find what is grandly called the theory of everything. Well, it's been said that the human talent for self-delusion is our most highly developed faculty. The fact that standard model cosmologists think they're even close to a theory of everything is pretty funny. To think everyone makes fun of the flat earth theory. Now personally, I give the flat earthers more credit. And at least they're smart enough to recognize the standard model for the nonsense that it is. And I can't blame people for searching for a little reason in this world when the standard model is what we're expected to believe in. So the main problem is, it isn't possible to have a theory of everything until we know everything about the universe. And we don't. And they really don't. For the mainstream, space is full of constant surprises. A trend that's only getting worse. Especially with James Webb up there defenestrating broken theories. The only lens any of this is being theorized through is the mathematical one. No wonder. Burying irreconcilable observations with broken models only works if you can keep patching over inconsistencies with more math. A seemingly endless grab bag of undiscoverable discoveries that keeps this model limping to the next failed prediction. That same New Scientist editorial continues. Physics' greatest endeavor has ground to a halt. We are in a period of utter confusion, said Nobel laureate David Gross, summing up the 2005 Solvay Conference on Quantum Structures of Space and Time. The Theory of Everything A single theory that's supposed to describe every force and particle in nature. The holy grail of cosmology. Well, I've had six more of these conferences since, but still no luck. The trouble is they're trying to join together pieces that don't fit. First piece was Einstein's relativity. It's been king for a century, but might not be the best fit for this theory. Although it deals with gravity, it doesn't tell us anything about the interactions of matter. More importantly, general relativity isn't compatible with quantum theory, which is the second piece of the puzzle. Since the 1960s, theorists have wrestled with this chestnut, but so far no one's managed to figure it out. They really need something to reconcile the two. And then came the great hope. The string theory. This one views particles as emanating from minuscule strings, and it's generated all kinds of mathematical descriptions linked to the dance of particles. But again, all these equations don't tell us anything about where space and time come from, and they don't describe anything we actually recognize. At best, string theory depicts the way particles might interact in a bunch of hypothetical universes. Great. For decades, string theorists have been excused from testing their ideas against experimental results. When astronomers misunderstood redshift and mistakenly decided space was expanding at an accelerating pace, string theory failed to support this hypothesis. Which I suppose is a plus for them, but their reasoning was interesting. Many of them suggested that their equations describe all possible universes and shouldn't be tied to matching data in just one of them. Only in a theoretical science do you get away with an excuse like that. When the theory doesn't match the only data set, is it science? Well, as they used to say in physics blogs, that we can, after all, call our universe unique. Why? Because it is the only one that the string theory cannot describe. Do we laugh or cry? I don't know. It's not even wrong. Even back in 2005, people knew string theory was headed for the dumpster. Gross thinks we're missing something fundamental. That we need a leap in understanding. Though where it'll come from is not clear. Many of the greatest minds in physics have weighed the idea, but no one can tie it all together. Hmm, what could they be missing? So what does the theory of everything need to do? Well, it has to underpin cosmology, which is the queen of the sciences, as they say. Cosmology is supposed to provide the story of life, the universe, and everything. So the theory of everything should provide a seamless big picture that encompasses all of our knowledge, from the subatomic to the galactic. I can't even believe there's people that think the inane hodgepodge of computer-generated theoretical whack-a-mole over at Big Space is even close to being able to make this claim. But imagine the consequences of getting it wrong. Our place in the universe could get pretty warped. 
Whether it's believing the night sky is a cloak being pulled across the firmament by a goddess, or that a magic explosion that came from nothing suddenly created everything. Belief in an incorrect major premises can pervert generations of science to explore in the wrong directions. That's a pretty significant setback in technological advancement of the species. Just look at the Big Bang Theory. It grew out of the incorrect assumption that redshift of faint objects in deep space is due to a Doppler effect that shows they are moving away from us. But Haldenar busted this theory. There's a million videos on it, not to mention his books. It's madness that we have to pretend his work isn't there in order to get taken seriously by these university fossils. I mean, he dropped a bomb on their theory, but now it's like a fart in an elevator. Some Big Bang professor hopes no one will notice. Anyway, by extrapolating these velocities in reverse, the redshift is supposed to give an origin in time that leads people to believe there must have been a primeval explosion that started it all. Einstein wrote equations that tried to describe the behavior of this so-called expanding universe, and his equations pointed to its probable instability. Gravitation was either strong enough to counter its expansion or too weak to prevent it from expanding forever. Alan Guth in the BBC Horizon program, Parallel Universes, writes, quote, In spite of the fact that we call it the Big Bang Theory, it tells us absolutely nothing about the Big Bang. It doesn't tell us what banged, why it banged, or what caused it to bang. It doesn't allow us to predict the conditions immediately after the bang. End quote. At the other extreme scale is quantum theory, which describes the behavior of subatomic particles. But the theory of gravitation and quantum behavior are completely incompatible. String theory was supposed to provide a theory of everything by unifying the incompatible theories together. The problem is that there's not just one string theory, there's many. Next came a push to develop the M-theory, which means the mother of all theories. That didn't work, and now in 2024, they've got one called the ultimate theory of everything. The effects of chasing these mathematical fairy tales has spread all over Western academia over the last century. You can't even deviate from the cult of Einstein in the simplest matters without being mercilessly attacked and ridiculed. They break out all their best professor insults, too. And no wonder. Einstein was the first to just toss verifiable physical laws and propose a holy mathematical theory. That's right up the mainstream alley. But mathematics ain't physics. Of course you can't tell that to a mathematician. Anyone who wants to go near cracking the chestnut of objective reality must first complete the grueling complex and abstract mathematics required for the task. If you don't do that, you have no voice. Who says so? Mathematicians, of course. A perpetually narrow view, like looking through the wrong end of a telescope and imagining you can see stars. It's led to the kind of gross elitism you can poke at with a stick. It gets so bad these guys are seeing God in their own image, as a mathematician. Herbert Dingle, an expert in relativity, actually attempted to discourage all this hubris. He publicly exposed an inconsistency in Einstein's special theory of relativity. Well, it didn't go well for him. And after the experts were done deliberately misinterpreting and misrepresenting the problem he posed, he wrote the following, and I quote, I am not yet convinced that facility in performing mathematical operations must inevitably deprive its possessor of the power of elementary reasoning, though the evidence against me is strong. End quote. The same expert was later moved to declare, The mathematician is more akin to a chess player than to one endowed with exceptional critical power. The faculty by which a chess expert intuitively sees the possibilities that lie in a particular configuration of pieces on the board is paralleled by that which shows the mathematician the much more general possibility is latent in an array of symbols. He proceeds automatically and faultlessly to bring them to light, but his subsequent correlation of his symbols with facts of experience, which has nothing to do with his special gift, is anything but faultless and is only too often the same nature as Lewis Carroll's correlation of his pieces with the Red Knight and the White Queen, with the difference whereas Dodson recognizes the products of his imagination to be wholly fanciful, the modern mathematician imagines, and persuades others, that he is discovering the secrets of nature. End quote. Whew, ouch. In other words, being good at math doesn't mean you're good at perception and critical reasoning. If you were, you'd have figured out black holes are dumb by now. 
This is why we've been perpetuating popular delusions dreamed up on a physics board that have no correlation to reality and predict pretty much nothing. Because mathematicians forgot that you can apply math to fiction, and in fact may well have been doing quite a bit of that for a hundred years. Where did all the natural philosophers and epistemologists go? Relativity theory, quantum theory, and string theory can't even claim to be physics. Just because the equations may appear to work doesn't prove the validity of the concepts involved. We need to distinguish between math and reality, and we need to stick them in their proper order. If we don't, and if we just accept math as evidence instead of descriptive language to help describe what we observe, then we wind up evaluating data with circular reasoning. Or maybe we find the analysis switches unnoticeable between incompatible models. For example, between a wave and a particle or between Einstein's and Lorenz's versions of the relativity theory. According to the scientific method, you make your observation, take measurements, add some math, and then you form your hypothesis. You make predictions and experiment, and if everyone who wants to takes their crack at sinking your hypothesis and can't, well, you got a theory. The experts got about as far as predict before things started going wrong for the Big Bang model. There is no experiment they can run outside of a computer model, and their hypothesis has failed nearly every prediction that it's made. From the amounts of elements we'd find early on, to the age, to the structure, every element has had to be endlessly patched with unobservable forces and magic particles we just can't seem to find. This hypothesis is busted. But it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There may just be a candidate that can fill in most of the blanks, check almost all the boxes, and explain just about everything we see and detect, every process and celestial motion we can observe and track, at least the real ones. One that follows the scientific method to make a coherent hypothesis, supported by experimental data and predictive success.